In North America, more people are choosing cremation. One of the unique features of this funeral home is the inclusion of a crematorium on site. This is where I like to show off what I do for a living. These machines actually are 38,000 pounds. They cost around $100,000 a piece. His two cremation chambers, called retorts, are about three meters long and two and a half meters high and wide. They can burn at a thousand degrees Celsius. So I guess there is a pyrotechnic or pyromaniac aspect to the actual job itself. But this is what I do every day. While many modern funeral homes have the cremation ovens located in a warehouse or garage, Patrick's are inside the actual funeral home and visible to the family. They can actually witness the initiation of the process, the cremation process. That allows them to have peace of mind in knowing that uh, are, they are going to receive their loved one back in the urn that they chose. As part of the farewell, a family member is invited to push the button that begins the cremation process. While the number of people being cremated in North America is increasing, so is the number of urns that are abandoned. Over 30,000 and counting. What really happens inside the crematorium once the button is pushed? After the casket has been placed inside the cremation chamber, a 300,000 BTU burner is ignited using natural or propane gas. Once the casket is totally consumed by flames, it collapses and exposes the body to direct fire. The body will incinerate for about two hours at a temperature that can reach over a thousand degrees Celsius. The smoke and gases released are conveyed to the afterburning chamber where they are burned off and then cooled before being evacuated through the chimney. A dead body goes through a lot of scientific procedures before it can be put to rest. When things heat up, you need to call in a professional. Dr. Steve Looker knows a thing or two about heat. He's an environmental engineer and makes retorts for a living. He became interested in retorts while working on another project at a cremation site. It was an interesting concept because I'd never seen a cremated body before and uh, when we opened the door and I saw the set of remains at the end, it was, uh, it was kind of thrilling. Steve went from knowing nothing about cremation retorts to being one of North America's leading experts. His company, B&L Cremation Systems, ships over 100 cremation machines a year to more than 40 countries. His plant is over 3,000 square meters with room enough for 35 retorts to be worked on at any given time. What makes these retorts special is the way they handle heat. And that takes place in the chamber. Building the frame of the chamber is the first step in the making of a retort. It's made of tubular steel. They then place sheets of steel on the inside of the frame and weld them together. They install a first layer of insulation on the inside. The second layer of insulation consists of bricks. These are key. Cremation retorts reach up to a thousand degrees Celsius for two to three hours, so these bricks are the first line of defense against the fire. Bricks are very important in the cremation process because they protect the the framework of the machine from, from the intense heat of the cremation process. The bricks are made of aluminous silicate, an aluminum-based sand material, and then chemicals are added as a binder. They are capable of withstanding temperatures of 1650 degrees Celsius. Queen Victoria's physician was an early proponent of cremation. In the 19th century, Sir Henry Thompson believed that the heat generated in the combustion process would obliterate any lethal germs that were spreading from the dead. 
If a body contained viruses, um, the heat of the cremation process is so intense that um, it has been scientifically proven that nothing can escape that heat and, um, and nothing is emitted from the crematory. So the viruses are killed on site inside the crematory. But if the cremation process does kill viruses, it also creates gases. Most of these gases are stopped in the afterburning chamber before being evacuated into the atmosphere. But some do manage to escape, like mercury. Mercury is found in dental fillings, and when a body is cremated, the heat vaporizes it. But these kinds of dental amalgams are less popular with dentists today. The average human body contains enough iron to make an eight centimeter nail, sulfur to kill all the fleas on an average dog, carbon to make 900 pencils, potassium to fire a toy cannon, fat to make seven bars of soap, phosphorus to make 2,200 matches, and water to fill a 10 gallon hat. The effluents coming from cremation are extremely low, but they're not zero. In Steve's retorts, the monitoring of the combustion process is automated. Temperature sensors are installed in the chamber. These sensors are wired to the control panel and they provide the data that will regulate the fuel and the airflow needed for the cremation. Currently, B&L makes six different types of cremation retorts. Some of these models are for very large bodies of up to 385 kilos. It takes five months to make one of these large size models and up to 18 workers can be involved in the process, two months longer than a regular model. A mammoth crane is needed to lift any one of these machines for transport. They weigh 18 tons. The demand is strong for Steve's retorts, and it's likely to keep up. It's fine by Steve. As an environmental engineer, he's convinced that burial pollutes more than cremation. Well, what can happen in ground burial is that the body actually um, decomposes and, and a lot of that material can go through the, the earth into, into the water table and, um, and end up being used for, for drinking water. Obviously would have been treated before, but it's, but it's just more chemicals that we're putting into, into the ground. Patrick O'Neill of the Anderson Funeral Home owns two of Steve's cremation retorts. After he's fired off the retorts, he monitors the heat and the duration of the process. He estimates that the time it takes to cremate a body is about one hour for every 45 kilograms. When the cremation is over, he collects the remains. Once the uh, cycle is complete, what we're left with is actually the bone fragments of the, uh, the body. Um, the bone fragments uh, don't actually burn. Patrick gathers these fragments for further processing. He uses a powerful magnet to pull away any tiny metal pieces, like dental fillings, and he removes orthopedic remains, like this metallic hip replacement. This is actually the cremated remains processor, so when we take the bone fragments, uh, we, we go ahead and reduce them down into a fine powder or dust. It works like a blender in your kitchen, just more powerful. You're left with about five to seven pounds of that cremated remain residue or dust. 